So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis that is uh, the main focus of the talk. And I will also mention to another disease that is related to that, that is frontotemporal dementia. So here we are talking about uh, the neurodegenerative diseases that as such, the onset uh, is on between the fifth and the sixth decade of life. In ALS, uh, this is uh, considered a rare disease because the incidence is uh, two, three people out of 100,000, and it is characterized by the degeneration of motor neurons. And the motor neurons are the neurons that are responsible for the movement of the skeletal muscle, so important for the, our voluntary movements. And they are present both here in the motor cortex, in the brainstem, and in the spinal cord. This disease is uh, clinically extremely heterogeneous. And uh, uh, looking at this, uh, um, th these are just the first and the second motor neuron that, uh, as is shown here, they control the different uh, muscles in our body. But uh, in this very nice review, what the authors highlighted is the difference uh, of the symptoms shown by the patients. This is just to show you that it's not very easy to uh, really uh, divide them in big categories because uh, they are divided in a lot of different subcategories. And this is the involvement uh, in the different colors of the different uh, impairments in their movement responsible for the involvement uh, either of the lower motor neurons or of the upper motor neurons. And uh, um, as I said, uh, the uh, heterogeneity is very high and then there is also a continuum with, uh, with another disease that, as I said, is frontotemporal dementia. And, and what I want to say is that uh, you need to keep in mind that in ALS, there are patients that show only problems uh, um, that are related to the motor component. And then there are patients instead where the involvement is here, like in purple, also linked to the cognitive or behavioral impairments. And then there are patients having both the symptoms typical of ALS and FTD. And then there are FTD patients that share many times, not only the clinics, but also um, some of the genes with, uh, with, with the motor neuron component with ALS. And then there is FTD. So these two diseases are in some way connected. From, uh, um, from, from a genetic point of view, also in this case, the situation is not very simple. The architecture of the genetic component of ALS is pretty complex. And uh, here I, there are uh, a lot of genes that have been associated to ALS so far. Uh, here I only reported uh, taking the inspiration from this review. Uh, the uh, genes, the most common uh, known gene are associated to causative for ALS. And as you can see here, both in the familiar forms and in the sporadic form, we still have a big component of unknown mutation really related to the disease. Among the genes that are causative for ALS, the most common one is the uh, microsatellite expansion in uh, C9 or 72. And then there is SOD1 that is the most abundant and mutation in a gene called TARBP and FAS. And this is, again, a, a nice, in my opinion, illustration of what it happens. So we have ALS uh, caused by one specific mutation that leads to the disease. And then that can be associated to risk gene. But what is becoming evident in the last year is that uh, there are also patients showing uh, um, more, several, like, you know, few or many mutations that are all inherited together. They are all present together. And of course, they increase the risk of developing uh, the disease. And the uh, point I want to remind you is that it's now pretty clear the fact that. Uh, uh, according to the mutation that the patient has, there are different uh, uh, comorbidities that can lead to the onset of the disease. For example, for people with mutation in SOD1, 
is just necessary to have one other external factor that can be the environment or a risk gene to develop the disease. For example, for people with mutation in the gene tar -BP, uh, BP, instead you need more situation, more probably environmental causes or risk associated factors or pathways that are altered that will lead to the onset of the disease. And uh, finally, uh, the last point I want to make is that excluding uh, the patients with mutation in SD1, for whom now we have uh, TOFERS and an antisense oligonucleotide therapy that is able to um, stabilize these patients, we don't have effective therapy disease. And that is probably due to the fact that the mechanism is uh, still partially uncovered. And then another point I want to make, even if today we will not talk about that, is that uh, we still do, uh, uh, the, we actually, the clinicians, the neurologists, uh, they, uh, they still uh, uh, have the diagnosis pretty late. So there is a huge effort and uh, we are collaborating also with several neurologists here in Italy to try to understand better when the disease starts to find out uh, uh, early biomarkers. So this is a slide uh, just showing, it's a very complex slide, but it shows uh, how the mechanisms uh, that have been linked to ALS are many in the cells. And here there are the different genes that are associated with the different altered pathways. And uh, I just want to stress the fact that uh, uh, there, is, uh, um, there are problems with protein homeostasis, there are problems with the RNA metabolism, with DNA repair, with mitochondrial dysfunction, so with, uh, uh, with problem in absence, and also accessory cells in the brain, like the glial cells, so lipodendrocytes, like microglia and astrocytes are implicated in the disease. Though there is something in common and something that can really unify all these um, different picture I gave you. And that is the fact that in 2006, uh, um, the common really factor among almost all cases of ALS uh, is the presence of uh, a protein called TDP43 that, uh, uh, in, uh, that uh, uh, forms inclusions, protein inclusions that are ubiquitinated in the tissue of uh, the 97% of ALS cases. And now it's becoming more evident that is also these aggregates or inclusions are also present in other neurodegenerative condition, as I told you, frontotemporal dementia, and also the late cases of Alzheimer's disease. And the other point that is in common among all these different uh, uh, cases of ALS is the fact that the disease usually starts in one part of the cortical spinal tract, and then it spreads uh, like in the nearby regions. And here there is just uh, the drawing of the motor cortex, but uh, this can happen also really uh, uh, in different parts of the cortical spinal tract. So there is something that induces a spreading of the disease to the nearby regions. And of course, also for this, there are several hypotheses. And today I will tell you ours. Um, I, I also need to, to make one point for the results I'm going to show you. And this point is that this disease is not cell autonomous. So, um, as I said before, the glial cells, and in particular astrocytes and microglia, were shown really to be able to modulate the uh, progression of the disease. In fact, the removal of the toxic protein from the astrocytes was sufficient to really uh, ameliorate the disease, really showing clearly that uh, the presence of the mutant protein in the astrocytes contributes uh, to uh, the uh, pathogenesis. And this is one uh, result that was uh, shown in the mice, the first mice that were developed uh, for the gene SOG1, in which here uh, the uh, 
and the mutant protein was deleted with a system. And as you can see here in red, wherever the um, SOD1, mutant SOD1 is not expressing the astrocytes, the mice live for longer. And there is a remarkable um, uh, increase in the progression, like in, in the length of the disease. So the mice lived for longer. Though uh, there is uh, uh, the general um, consensus on the fact that uh, these mice do not show a classical TTP43 pathology. So uh, we decided to, to see whether that was also true in another model, a model of uh, TTP43 pathology that was uh, produced and published by John Cleveland in 2013. In this mice, we have a lock system uh, where the TDP43 is under the PRP promoter. So that means that the protein is expressed in the central nervous system and in the muscles. And uh, we culture the astrocytes first. Okay. Here you can see the expression of the transgene that is mostly nuclear, the, uh, the TDP43. And then we perform a very simple nuclear to cytosolic fractionation and uh, uh, what we observed is that also the uh, behavior of the endogenous TDP43 changed in the presence of the mutant uh, TDP43. So it stays more to the cytosol, and that it's a typical feature of the TDP43 pathology is one of them. So what we did it was to try to excise also in our case, and these are just some preliminary data, the TDP43 from the um, astrocytes. These are mice at six months, so they are still not really uh, fully um, symptomatic. Oh, I don't have, uh, sorry, the, the genotype, probably I lost it. But here in black, uh, you have the controls uh, in um, that uh, have uh, a promoter. So we, we remove the TDP43 from the astrocytes. So these are the control mice. These are the TDP mice where the TDP is expressed in all the body, and these are the ones in which the TDP is not expressed in, uh, um, in the astrocytes. And as you can see, there is a slight uh, amelioration in the grip stand, so in the muscle force. There is amelioration in the motor coordination with the rotorod. I'm, I'm sorry for all the labels. And then there is also uh, a, an amelioration in the cognition. So as you can see here, the mice with TDP43 mutation, they uh, here they should, uh, so the black, the full dots are the one where the mice are asked to choose either an object and the empty box are an, another mouse is a sociability test related to cognition. And here, the TDP43 mice do not have any more a particular interest over the novel mouse. Instead, when you remove the TDP43 from the astrocytes, you still preserve that. So again, these are preliminary data, but they are going in that direction. So we decided to study a little bit better uh, the uh, uh, what was uh, particular about these astrocytes. And as you can see here, we perform a proteomic analysis where we observe that uh, around 1,400 genes, the proteins were differentially expressed. The one in dark blue are overexpressed, the one in light blue are uh, underexpressed. And this is a TDP43 mutation versus control in astrocytes. And uh, here we derive a network of what uh, is uh, changing the most. And as you can see, uh, we were pretty happy to see that as expected, uh, most of the proteins that are downregulated are related to um, RNA processing because probably this is linked to a loss of function of the TDP43 that is an RNA binding protein and does that as main function. And uh, also we have an impairment probably in, in some proteins related to translation or metabolism. And then we were pretty surprised to see instead an increase in protein related to integrin signaling, to focal adhesion, endocytosis, and uh, uh, semaphorin signaling. So we went ahead and we wondered what could be uh, like, you know, one 
of the reason why we saw these differences. And so we just used the databases to understand among all these proteins that were differentially expressed, which are the factors that uh, could be linked to these, uh, these regulated proteins. Uh, as you can see here, among 400 of our 1,400 proteins were related to making go in two cases and some others to H2F1. And we were interested in understanding a little bit more why two genes that are related to cell cycle or, or cancer could be associated to ALS. So we, we did several experiments here. I'm just reporting the end of, of the observation that came out with the fact that when we ask if the activity of this transcription factor that is a CMYK was in some way altered in our ALS model, we saw, and we did that by using a luciferase reporter transcriptional assay. So here there is a uh, a small part of a promoter with the responsive elements for MIC, and we measure the activity of the luciferase. And as you can see here, so there is a significant uh, uh, decrease in a CMYK activity in the presence of mutant TDP43. And that uh, went well uh, in line with the fact that when we try to see the proliferation rate uh, of our astrocytes in vitro, we saw that our astrocytes do proliferate less and CIMIC is, is a factor implicated in cell cycles. So that was uh, uh, really in agreement with these results. We also wonder whether uh, uh, only in our mice we could see, and that was maybe specific of the model. So we took uh, uh, wild type cortical neurons. We transduced these neurons with uh, either wild type TDP43 of different mutants for TDP43. And as you can see here, just the overexpression of wild type TDP43 was sufficient to reduce. Uh, the um, the activity of CMYK. And interestingly enough, as I told you, in the SOD1 mutation, TTP43 does not really have, uh, like, you know, the classical pathological uh, behavior. And in fact, uh, and that is also true for the mutation in FAST. And in fact, in these uh, two cases, we didn't see a difference in CMYK. So we think that is uh, something really linked to TDP43 alteration. We also wonder if that was specific only to astrocytes or also to neurons. And uh, interestingly enough, when we performed the experiments in primary cortical neurons transduced with different mutants for TDP43, or when Antonia Ratti um, in, at the University of Milan tried to do that in iPS-derived motor neurons from C9 or patients, we didn't see a difference. So since that this impairment is specific uh, for the glia, for the astrocytes, we then tried to give an explanation to uh, this uh, difference. And uh, we are still working on the real mechanism, but here there are some hints. Uh, we didn't see a difference in MIC total expression, both at the RNA and at the uh, protein level. And so we reason on the fact that in TDP in, uh, um, in TDP43 pathology in, in ALS, uh, there is a problem in the nuclear cytoplasmic uh, transport, and several nucleoporins that are implicated in the transport do not function very well, and they are responsible for getting in and getting out uh, proteins. And so in our proteomic analysis, we saw that the POM 121, that is one of the most important nucleoporins really keeping the nucleopore whole together is actually among the proteins that are downregulated. So we wonder if we could validate this data also with the immunofluorescence. Here probably it's, uh, I don't know how much you can see, but we measure. And also here I lost the labels, but uh, I should have done a, a PowerPoint. Sorry about that. But here again, we have wild type, and these are the TDP43. And as you can see, POM 121 is a slightly like, you know, it's reduced. These are more than 800 nuclei per condition. 
And uh, we have a, a decrease, a small but significant decrease in the immunofluorescence levels. So then uh, we wonder whether MYC was less present in the nucleus in the mutant condition. And as you can see here, we saw that with the, a biochemical approach by dividing cytosol and nucleus. And we also confirmed that with immunofluorescence by uh, measuring the intensity of CMYC in the nucleus of either wild type or mutant uh, astrocytes. So we think that uh, there is a problem in CMYC getting inside uh, the, um, the nucleus and the work as a transcription factor. We then ask if uh, all of these would have a relevance uh, for the disease. And in order to do that, we induce a simic loss of function in wild type flies. So we silence simic uh, in collaboration with Alessia Soldano, that is now here in Trieste, and, the CISA, and uh, she was at Cibio until a few weeks ago. And what we did it was to silence simic in the glia of adult flies, because if you do that uh, during the larva stage, the flies simply do not uh, um, do not continue their life because MIC is too important for their development. So we, we look at the performance with a classical climbing assay. Here I'm reporting just the mates because uh, the phenotype is a little more aggressive than in the females, but the results in the females are pretty uh, similar they just start to show up at seven days. And what you can see here is that with two different siRNA for CMYK, there is uh, an alteration in the climbing activity that is also paired with a, a decrease in the lifespan of the flies. So we, we say, okay, why does the uh, uh, ablation of uh, um, CMYK in control flies lead to a, a motor phenotype. And so, which is the contribution of CMYK in the eventually in the T TDP43 pathology? In order to do that, we silence CMYK in astrocytes, again, control. And we again went uh, uh, with the proteomic analysis to compare the data with the previous one. We didn't find, we found uh, less genes that were changed, probably for the level of silencing that we could reach. And uh, what was puzzling to us is that uh, uh, if we look at uh, the uh, proteins that do change the most when we silence MIC, we found a lot of proteins that are related to membrane-bound vesicles and extracellular vesicles. And that was shown both with the Jensen databases and with another tool that was developed in Gabriella Viera's lab, yeah, the CNR in Trento. Okay, so we, we asked to put together all these pieces and we wonder whether the loss of CMYK causes an alteration in the cell-to-cell -cell communication and in particular to extracellular vesicles. And a few years ago, Alla Spada wrote a review in which he was describing different ways in which the spreading can happen and the communication between neurons can happen, really highlighting the fact that sometimes uh, the different factors can move from one neuron to the others through exocytosis, retrograde, retrograde transport, anterograde transport. And uh, he also mentioned the fact that the proteins uh, can simply be released outside in a classical prion-like hypothesis of propagation of spreading or and, and then damage, or the exchange can also happen through nanotubes and uh, uh, extracellular vesicles. And so um, what are these extracellular vesicles? They are very simple nanostructures that are released by all different uh, cells in our body and they circulate also in our body fluids. There are different types of extracellular vesicles. Uh, at least uh, this is still the way in which we sort of divide them. There are the exosomes that are formed here at the level of the late endosome, and they are formed uh, by different kinds of signaling that are under study uh, really at the moment. 
So we, we still don't know everything about the cell biology, but we know that uh, after the formation of the multivesicular bodies for the endosome that do not fuse with the lysosome, then uh, these multivesicular bodies will release outside extracellular vesicles called exosomes, or we also have bigger vesicles that are just done by a blabbing of the membrane, and they are called uh, microvesicles uh, or uh, um, also ectosomes, uh, microparticles. There are there are different names, and they are usually linked to a difference in calcium concentration. And uh, these extracellular vesicles uh, can be um, really observed in the fluids by the expression of specific markers like uh, tetraspanin, like uh, CD9, CD63, CD81, or other proteins that are internal carboproteins like alix, flotilin, and synteny. So we were uh, very happy to see these results because during my the last work I did during my PhD, uh, I observed that astrocytes uh, in uh, SOD1 mutation, they release extracellular vesicles that were toxic to motor neurons. And the experiments I performed here, we performed in Milan, really just giving uh, um, mutant extracellular vesicles or extracellular vesicles derived from mutant astrocytes to wild-type motor neurons was sufficient to induce the death of these motor neurons. So we decided to uh, purify the vesicle source in the TTP43 model uh, with, with a method that was established by a colleague of mine in Trento, uh, Professor Vito D'Agostino, that is based on the charges, but we also then did the purification with the classical ultracentrifugation. We uh, then uh, check for the markers I told you before to make sure that uh, we could purify vesicles, and this is part of the minimal requirements uh, to work on extracellular vesicles. These are positive markers for the vesicles, alix and nexin, flotilin and nexin 11, and gm 113 and lamin B1 are instead the negative markers, and in fact, we don't have them. And then we perform electron microscopy to make sure that we could have vesicles in our uh, study. So again, I know it's a little bit repetitive, but we went again to the proteomics. We see if when uh, uh, we had the mutation in TDP43, we, uh, what was in common among the protein that were differentially expressed between the mutation in TDP43 and control compared to when we silence a CMIC, again, to, to understand how CMIC can have an impact on these extracellular vesicles. And uh, what was interesting is that when we did the correlation maps between uh, what is a change uh, uh, in the presence of mutant TDP43 versus the silencing of MIC with the two different siRNA, we saw a, a very uh, nice and high correlation on the fact that uh, when uh, uh, we modulate MIC, we probably have a cargo in wild type condition. We have a cargo of the vesicle that is very similar to when we have mutation in TDP43. So probably uh, what MIC does is really changing whatever it is either inside or outside these vesicles. So in order to understand again, if there was any biological effect, we first check if our vesicles were able to enter into the receiving neurons by expressing uh, uh, with viral vector uh, CD63, that is a tetraspanning uh, to, to monitor vesicles uh, linked to GFP. We isolated the vesicles from astrocytes, we give them to the neurons, and then we look at the imaging. And here it's not very simple to see, but uh, we have very small dots here showing the internalization in the 3D reconstruction of these vesicles inside the neurons. Then here, uh, in collaboration with Silvana and Julia here at the ICGV, we decided to, to understand which was if there was an effect of these vesicles on the receiving neurons. And so we ran a time point and we saw that actually the 16 hours were the most interesting one. That is also the time in which the vesicles are getting inside. 
So we purify the vesicles, we give the vesicles to well-type neurons, we harvest the neurons, and we perform a quant seek. And uh, uh, when Silvana and Julia analyzed the data, what they saw, it was that uh, only in the condition in which the neurons, the control neurons, received the mutant uh, vesicles, there was a huge difference uh, in the gene expression. And uh, the pathways that were derived, again, in dark blue, there are the pathways that are upregulated, and in uh, light blue, the ones that are downregulated. As you can see here, so there are uh, um, pathways related to mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation and to apoptosis as the one upregulated, and others related to DNA repair that uh, are, for example, in the RNA processing, that are downregulated. So we wanted to validate this data. So we decided to use a, a high content microscope like the Image Express. We cultured the wild type neurons in a 96 well plate. We treated the neurons with uh, vesicles wild type or derived from mutant astrocytes. We waited for a longer time, for seven days, to see if there was an effect. And as you can see here, when we counted the number of neurons in the average that were remain alive, uh, plating the same number, we saw that there was a 20% of decrease in the viability of the wild type neurons that received the mutant uh, vesicles. And uh, we also validate that in uh, uh, motor neurons. So uh, finally, uh, to, to go back and finish with Mick. We wonder whether, and we expected that uh, if we silence now CMYK in well type astrocytes, we should have a damage of T receiving neurons. We purify the vesicles and then we give the ferrous vesicle to well type neurons. We, we should see a damage. But then, uh, and, and that is uh, exactly the same that happens with the mutant vesicles in the TDP43 mutation. I'm uh, sorry, in, in, in what type neurons are receiving mutant TDP43 vesicles. And then we hypothesized that by overexpressing MIC in vitro, we could see a rescue. And uh, uh, we, we actually were lucky enough to see those results when we silenced MIC and we gave vesicles to wild type neurons. We saw an increase in neuronal death that was not exacerbated in the mutant condition. When we overexpress, Mick, we saw a rescue of the effect, at least in vitro. So just to conclude, we are working now at this model and uh, uh, that, that tries to understand whether an alteration in SMIC activity could alter the milieu of, uh, of, of the central nervous system, and in particular, the communication between astrocytes and neurons and could lead to a spread and could facilitate the spread of toxicity. And I also want you to think a little bit about the fact that in 2021, P53, that is a simic antagonist, was shown to be upregulated in, uh, um, in the C9 North mutation, that, is, uh, uh, that are the most common mutation in TDP43, uh, sorry, in ALS cases. And also a recent paper by Fred Gage showed that, uh, for example, MIC and other oncogenes or oncosuppressor are altered in their activity also in Alzheimer's disease. So we are wondering whether really this uh, link between uh, cancer and neurodegeneration uh, could, could be really uh, real and several evidence are coming out in the last uh, time. Finally, I want also to say that uh, uh, we don't know exactly if the problem is at the level of the halter cargo logic or at the problem it's related to the fact that uh, whatever is outside the vesicles uh, makes uh, the ability of the vesicles to enter differently in the receiving cells. And so this is something that uh, Paolo Fioretti in the lab is doing during his PhD. And I'm talking about uh, uh, that because we observed that among the proteins that were differentially expressing the mutant TGP43 condition, we found as top score the beta integrins. 
and the integrins are extremely important in docking vesicles to the, the recipient cells. And so uh, we, uh, we wonder whether there is an impairment in the amount of vesicles that get inside. Paolo developed cell lines in which he overexpressed two different tetraspanin that are typical of two different subpopulations of extracellular vesicle, CD9 and CD81. He purified the vesicles from these cell lines and he incubated these vesicles with recipient cells that were marked with cherry. And he counted uh, with the confocal microscope uh, how many of these vesicles were getting inside, giving the same amount of vesicles in, in the situation. And what was interesting is that in our model in which he overexpressed TDP43, the vesicles were remarkably getting more inside than in controlled condition. So the take-home message is that uh, these diseases are for sure complex. Uh, and there is a spread of the pathology that we still don't understand exactly why it happens. There are several hypotheses, but we think that we can add to these hypotheses the fact that the miscommunication can help driving the uh, disease or it contributes to the disease. Maybe it's not only the cargo, but also what is outside of this vesicle that is a key for the spreading of the disease. And again, the idea is just that uh, probably make alteration or whatever this extracellular uh, miscommunication is not really alone inducing the disease, but it could be one of the steps getting to that and facilitating that. And of course, I want to acknowledge the fact that uh, we didn't do uh, almost anything in vivo because it's very difficult still, and we are still lacking tools uh, to do experiments uh, well done in vivo for this uh, miscommunication, but it's something where we need to, to try to go. And then finally, it took us a long time to understand really what we were having and looking in our um, EVs, uh, because again, there is a, a still a lot uh, to be taken in consideration when the data are analyzed. And so I encourage all of you to follow uh, uh, whatever we will discuss in two weeks in Trento and Milan. That is a workshop that is promoted by the Inter International Society of Extracellular Vesicle, if you're interested in this topic. And we will also make a report out of that. And we will talk about single vesicles and uh, omics uh, for what needs to be done really from now to the next uh, years. Finally, uh, I really want to thank all of my lab members because it's not easy to work on this project and they were really resilient in doing that and uh, really trying to understand would be a little bit better these results. And all the collaborators that uh, here I show data coming really from different labs, many labs gave us uh, tools uh, to work with. And uh, uh, and then, of course, the funding agency for allowing us to carry the project on. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>